everybody. So today, uh, Sebastian, one of our other new postdocs, uh, will tell us about his work on extended Fierosaur algebra in uh, superstring conformal field theory. Okay, thank you very much. So, as Ilarian was saying, I'm a new postdoc and I just arrived from Portugal, from Lisbon. And that's where my collaborator, Ricardo Schiappa, is still sitting, or standing, or I don't know. Um, and I will talk about some aspects of conformal field theory of the superstring. And with superstring, I mean those formulations of superstring where target space supersymmetry is manifest. So not the RNS string, but uh, formulations like the green schwartz string, or Berkowitz pure spinner string, or some other formulation that is known as the C string, which I will also uh, introduce to you. And um, the, the gauge constraint algebra of these formulations, in particular of the green schwartz string, uh, they generate some extension of the Virasova algebra, and that's the topic of today's talk. So this, this algebra had been calculated already quite a while back at classical level, in 1985, by, by Siegel. That's why it's known as the Siegel algebra. And since then, it's still lacking a, an anomaly free quantum completion. So what is this algebra made of? Um, that the well-known gauge symmetries of the action are, are first the virtue diffeomorphisms. And they are generated by the energy momentum tensor or the VSO constraints. So note that I will use Siegel's notation A for the energy momentum tensor instead of T, but I will reserve the T for later for the ghost extended. So AZZ is the energy momentum tensor. And then we have a local fermionic symmetry, the famous Kappa symmetry, which is generated by 16 fermionic constraints beta alpha. So alpha is running from 1 to 16. Uh, and the ZZ just indicates that it has the same component like, like A. And I'm usually printing bold face all objects that are Grassmann odd. So B is Grassmann odd because it's a fermionic symmetry. The, the, the Z, Z in the first one, A, comes from second transymmetric tensor, plus alpha. Yes. But for Kappa symmetry, fermionic symmetry, the Z, Z, what does it exactly, uh, what motivates this notation, Z, Z notation? What does it mean? Well, every, every z gives you conformal weight 1, and two z's give you conformal weight 2. And you can see it, for a, you can see it as the component of a rank 2 tensor. And for, yeah, that's and, okay. What about b? And for, b. for b, um, <coughs> well, I, I guess you could also see it as a component of a rank 2 tensor. Um, I haven't, I don't know about the, the other components. There will be a bz bar, z bar for the right moving uh, kappa symmetry generators. But um, there's probably also no BZ, BZ bar or something like that. OK, we'll see later when you show that. I'll we'll bring it up again if you have the fire press. So I didn't really think about that, but I think it's just the same um, as for A. OK. Then um, the algebra of these constraints of the Kappa symmetry generators and, and of A does not close by itself, um, but it requires two, two other constraints that C called C and D in order to be a closed algebra. And C has also conformal weight 2, ZZ, and D has conformal weight 3, and C has two target space spinner indices. So alpha and beta are running from 1 to 16. And D has one vector index, target space vector index. This A is running from 1 to 10 or 0 to 9. Is there symmetry in alpha beta? Uh, yes, here that's anti-symmetric. Yeah. Mm. And 
And um, so this ABCD, they built the, the CD algebra, and it now goes naively at the quantum level without introducing any ghost fields. Then it's not surprising that one discovers a lot of anomalies because ghost fields are usually needed to cancel anomalies. Mm. To see if they generate uh, some big symmetries. Say, say it again. To see and D, the new constraints generate uh, new PG symmetries or the other symmetries? Oh, oh, you mean of the green Schwartz string? Uh, yes. um, so they are, uh, they generate H symmetries, but not of the green Schwartz string, but of the Siegel string. I will come back to that subtlety later. Um, but they appear, they would appear also in the analysis of the green Schwartz string phase space analysis if you calculate uh, the, the, con the first class constraint algebra of the green schwarz string. Um, the, the reason is at, in the green schwarz string you have second class constraints that you cannot easily implement without breaking covariance. And if you don't implement the second class constraints, uh, then you get these C and Ds. But if you would implement the second class constraints, C and D do not appear at all because the second class constraint uh, imply that also C and D vanish. Um, yeah, that's a bit hand waving now, maybe, uh, maybe it's a little bit clearer later. Um, so it's it's the task to cancel these these anomalies <coughs> and um, as there's no standard um, standard procedure to covariantly quantize the green Schwartz string, it has a long story of uh, efforts to, to follow standard procedures to covariantly quantize the green Schwartz string and for several reasons that's, that's not so easy. But the formulation that comes close to closest to a covariant quantization of the green Schwartz string is Berkowitz's so-called Pew Spinner formalism. And uh, it's not derived from first principles, um, but nevertheless, it's a fair it's a fair question whether in this formalism one can cancel these anomalies. Uh, so whether it's possible, and the question whether it's expected is because, as the pure spinner formalism is not directly derived from the Green Schwartz formalism, we do not know if it's really based on the same gauge symmetries. So if all these gauge symmetries are expected to appear also in the in the pure spinner formalism, but at least it's worth <coughs> a try to search for them. Mm. In fact, the, the pure spinner community, or, or Berkowitz himself, are mainly trying to establish uh, just the energy momentum tensor as a gauge symmetry to make it appear T exact didn't really care about the others. Mm. Yeah, and I was using Mathematica to try to answer these questions. Okay, and that was the lengthy introduction. Um, next I will give a short review of the green short string, uh, then present the classical serial algebra, and say some words about what the Siegel string is. Uh, then I will present the, uh, the anomalies, so that's some, some own work. And uh, then I will move, move over to the, to the pure spinner formalism and uh, discuss some operators that seem like the natural extension of the Siegel operators, call them chain operators and their, their algebra, but then I will argue that this is, not, this is not yet what we are looking for. One needs to, uh, to go a step further, and then I present what I think is the correct gauge constraint algebra at the bottom of that. Okay. So first, remember that the green Schwartz string as well uh, as also the Siegel string and also the Berkowitz string, they all have in common um, that they have an embedding of the two-dimensional string word sheet sigma into a 10 plus 
32 dimensional flat like two target superspace. Um, so on the top of each slide there would be some beautiful headline, but that's not really important. <laughs> um, okay, and here I have some some blackboard drawing because usually I never include drawings into my talks, so I thought I need to do so. But it's actually just to set the, the notations. There's not much information in this drawing. So we have, uh, this is target superspace. XM are the, the bosonic coordinates. Just the mouse doing the action. XM are the 10 bosonic coordinates of the target space. Then theta alpha are 16 fermionic co coordinates. And then we have the second copy, theta hat alpha hat. 16, so 32 fermionic coordinates, and then on the word sheet sigma, we have complex coordinates z and z bar, um, and the embedding functions xm of z and z bar, or, and theta alpha of z and z bar, I denote in the same way as, uh, as the coordinates. I hope that doesn't confuse you. And then um, in the cotangent space of the target space, uh, we would like to have a local frame that is supersymmetric invariant. And for the theta directions, it's enough to just take the, uh, the coordinate frame, just the theta, while in the x direction one needs to make this redefinition and define a supersymmetric invariant uh, frame IA. And this is an important building block for all the supersymmetric variant. Uh, is we in uh, 2A or 2B? Uh, just 2 without. Two. Dis so but then what's the meaning of alpha hat? Why did you introduce alpha hat? Yeah, so alpha hat means if it's, if it's 2A, then an alpha hat upstairs is an alpha downstairs. And if it's 2B, then an alpha hat upstairs is an alpha upstairs just to treat okay. as long as possible both cases. To treat both cases, I see. Okay. okay. Um, okay. And, then, and then we use the, the pullback of this pi A to this word chat, uh, to this word, to this word sheet. Um, and that will be the, the main building block of the Sorry, so it's invariant on the supersymmetry, and that's and the supersymmetry transformation is done here. <laughs> okay. Um, so these these pies, the those pi z and pi z bar are now the pullback components to the word sheet of this supersymmetric invariant one form, and uh, this replaces the kinetic term the bosonic string, and this is manifestly supersymmetric invariant, and then there comes this extra term, which is the Westermina term, which is not manifestly supersymmetric because it has this negative theta, but uh, the variation of it is a total derivative, so under the integral it's also supersymmetric. And the, uh, the equations I am, so that's I just as a reminder. Uh, the equations of motion are unfortunately non-free. Uh, I'm stressing this just because later I will use all the time free fields. So I need to justify why I can use free fields in spite of having non-free fields uh, for the functional on string. Um, so free fields would be here. If the bar theta were zero, then we would have a free theta, and this would imply also a free x, y, and the second equation, but like this we have just some pro projection on it, is zero. Um, so these are the equations of motion, already in conforming gauge, so I was immediately removing the, the work sheet metric. And in addition, we have the, we need to impose the VLSO constraints by hand. Usually they come from the variation of the metric, but that's already gone. So these are the the ZZ components of the energy momentum tensor the constraint to vanish and the same for the Z bar, Z bar. 
And then uh, the particular thing about the green thought string is, of course, that this local fermionic sym symmetry, the kappa symmetry, uh, which looks like pi slash, so pi, pi B contracted with a gamma matrix acting on the fermionic H parameter kappa. That's the, the variation of theta. And the variation of X is like a supersymmetry variation respect to the theta variation, just that it has the opposite sign. So it's more like a, uh, it's acting like a supersymmetric covariant derivative. Let's see. Mm -hmm. Okay, the last line is not important, so it's a little bit falls off. Mm -hmm. Any questions so far? Please never hesitate to interrupt me. You might if you could see the bottom of your trash. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can. So, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, they're saying. Can you uh, make the sides smaller so that it fits the screen, or is it difficult? Because we may miss important information later. Well, I can. If it's really important, I will put it on the blackboard. Okay. This one here, I promise you, is not so important. Okay. We'll try to get that fixed for later. Sometime. Well, actually, maybe, okay, it's okay. important, but I, I would have been happy to ignore it for a while. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, it basically says that this form of the kappa symmetry, honestly, is not really a symmetry of this green schwartz action and conformal gauge, because it does not respect the conformal gauge. So, it's basically just taking the, cup, the full kappa symmetry that that uh, contains also transformation of the metric, and then um, plugging in the form of the metric in conformal gauge, and ignoring the transformation of of H. So in, in fact, the metric H would here transform with stuff, uh, but it would transform and it shouldn't. <laughs> and one can, but one can compensate this with some uh, with some diffeomorphism. And that's uh, maybe at the end of the talk I will come back to this. But anyway, this is the form of the original kappa symmetry if one doesn't if one doesn't modify it and it goes to the conformal gauge. Um, yeah, so I might put this on the next slide. That's good surprise. Ah, yeah. Okay, we are already starting with the, so the headline is Classical Siegel Algebra uh, 1. Um, so the Classical Siegel Algebra, as I was saying in the beginning, it's, it's generated by these constraints, by the constraints of, by the generators of local kappa symmetry and by those of, of um, diffeomorphism invariants. And the generators of local kappa symmetry, so maybe let me, let me go back again to the previous slide. As I was saying here, the transformation of kappa symmetry, this form here is like the action of the supersymmetric covariant derivative. Um, and then uh, we had the, then we have the transformation of, of theta in front. So basically what we expect is we have this transformation of theta without the parameter kappa, so just pi slash pi b contracted with gamma b and then contracted with, uh, with the supersymmetric covariant derivative. That's what we expect as the generator. So that's what we have here. Pi slash contracted with the supersymmetric covariant derivative. And this small d is now, let's say, the phase space realization of the supersymmetric covariant derivative. Um, so pi is the old pi. The d is some some p, which is just the conjugate momentum to theta in phase space, and then we have we have this term, which uh, where this here acts like like um, an x derivative in phase space. So if you take the commutator of the Poisson bracket, then this is um, this one with x just gives one, so it acts like a derivative on x. So this is a phase space realization of. of but uh, now you are treating it as a new field, fundamental field. 
I yeah, but okay. that means you have to change the go back and change the Lagrange and modify to make a single string or Yes, that's what I'm doing what I'm going to do in the end. But but here it's now a phase space discussion and there mm -hmm. it's it's fair to have a phase space variable that is conjugate to theta and also for the green short string. Oh okay. I don't need okay. to go to the Lagrangian. Okay, yeah. that's true. Okay. But uh, yeah. Mm. So those are the, the generators of local copper symmetry if I want to generate them this say the Poisson bracket. And uh, for the diffeomorphisms, um, I need this term to generate the diffeomorphisms of, of X. And I also need an extra term to generate diffeomorphisms of theta. Um, so if I act on theta with the Poisson bracket, it will give me d theta, so it's it's a shift in, in theta. And uh, as I was saying, we denote it by A and not by, by T. And uh, interestingly, if one takes this, uh, this relation between P and D and plugs it in here, then one can rewrite it in this supersymmetric form, where we just have pi squared plus D theta D. And Maybe you remember that on the previous slide, uh, I have already shown one version of the energy momentum tensor at the Lagrangian level, where we just had pi squared and not this extra term. And the reason is that, uh, so this is now in, in phase space, and the reason is why we get this extra term and it's still consistent, is that D is actually a phase space constraint. So D is constrained to be zero. So it's consistent that A is, um, so A being this whole thing is consistent with A just being the, the first part because D is constrained to be zero in the green short string. And this is this troublesome constraint that makes covariantly quantizing the green short string so, so hard because D alpha uh, is in a, in a reducible representation. Uh, it's a Majorana Valley spinner and you cannot split it in yeah and it's it's um, if you calculate its its algebra uh, then you see that it's neither purely first class nor, nor purely second class and if you want to separate it in second and first class you would need to split the Majorana Valley uh, spinner and that you cannot do without breaking covariance. Um, so the idea is now, therefore, that we calculate the first class algebra without imposing this constraint. So we are not imposing d equals zero, but we just look at the first, at those constraints where we know they are purely first class. B and A are purely first class because they generate the gauge uh, transformations, and then see what what algebra we we get if we get those algebra. What's the, what's the maximal uh, subgroup, subalgebra for Lorentz algebra to preserve while well, solving the string? The maximum, sorry, you say it again, the maximum subgroup? Oh, so, so you have uh, this Majorana vial of SO10 that you can't break up, right? Uh, but if I allow you to break it up, how much of it, how much of the SO10 can you save? <laughs> Just SU5, or is there? Uh, yeah, so there's a U5. Um, okay, I haven't dealt too much with this question, but there's a similar, something similar appears in the pure spinner mm -hmm. string, where one has a constraint on the uh, on the ghost, which is a pure spinner constraint, and and that one. Uh, in order to solve that one explicitly, one goes to U5 variables and preserves a U5. I'm not sure if this is really the maximum one can do there, mm -hmm. but uh, a U5 for sure. <laughs> mm. Okay, and then the other, the, the next point that, that might be confusing in the presentation that I'm going to give you is. Uh, I will, in the following, I will 
I will work with three fields. And the, the idea is that in order to calculate the algebra, um, I do not really need the equations of motion. What I need is algebraic information that I get from, say, equal time commutators. So these, this phase-based description of, the, um, of these constraints in terms of um, canonically conjugate variables already uniquely determines uh, the, the equal time commutators between the variables. And that means if I take, if I replace these variables by free variables, they still will have the same equal time commutators. They will differ as soon as I go off the equal time, but at equal time, they will have the same commutators. Um, later, I will make another. Why is that? Uh, why is it a very complicated nonlinear theory? Has the same two point function, equal time commutator? As the free theory, uh, can you remind us why is that? Well, it has the same, the same phase space variables. In. But in fact, if you would if you would implement this constraint, the second class constraint, d equals zero, and build an honest Dirac bracket, then the story would be different. But if we if we stay in the extended phase space, let's say. Uh, and ignore this constraint d equals zero, uh, and use the canonical. Um, but then we just have canonical conjugate variables p to theta, and we we define uh, our objects in, in terms of these conjugate variables, and always the Poisson bracket between p and theta will be one, no matter how the equations of motion for for theta are. So. That, that's why one has an algebraic isomorphism, but I will later also give a motivation why it makes more sense, why it's not only this algebra isomorphism, but why um, Siegel algebra, uh, the Siegel string and the Green Schwartz string are actually at classical level equivalent. Mm. I, I will come to, back to that later. Mm. So that's what I was saying. We we go now to a free string action. I just take a, a free x and and theta is conjugate p, and with equations of motion just d bar theta is zero. And then we just define the same objects in in the same way, such that as I was saying, equal time Poisson brackets will be isomorphic to those in the green short string. But now. Um, using this free field representation, uh, we can use uh, OPE techniques. That may sound stupid because we are still at classical level, but um, it can be useful also to, to use OPEs at the classical level and just drop the whole or quantum contribution. So if, if you take some uh, parameter that uh, takes keeps track of um, of quantum contributions. So I was using alpha, alpha prime as the quantum parameter. And whenever alpha prime appeared with a square, I just dropped it to, to do the classical calculations. So then one can do OPE calculations that are equivalent to doing Poisson, equal time Poisson bracket calculations. Mm. And as I was saying, we simply do not constrain D to vanish. And, um, Interesting but well known observation is that uh, that this free string up here uh, can actually be re rewritten if one plugs here the relation between P and this cosmetic covariant derivative D. Uh, then it can be written as the complete Green Schwartz string previously, plus these two terms that would vanish if D uh, were constrained to be zero. Yeah, and then um, all what we need to, uh, or the, the basic ingredients to do the algebra calculations are the, the commutators or the OPEs between the supersymmetric building blocks. Um, so we have pre-field OPEs between dx and x and between p and e. 
Jupiter, and they imply these OPEs between these supersymmetric building blocks. So one actually gets a, a nice Katsumuri algebra. Does the classical limit mean uh, the Poisson style calculation? Does it mean you do just one contraction? Yes. Rather than multi contraction? Yes. Same yes. thing, right? Just yes. one contraction. Yes. Okay. Mm. Yeah, so this is the basic underlying Katsumuri algebra between these supersymmetric curves. And um, these OPEs, we, we will need all the but you don't need to memorize them, but they enter all of these calculations that come in the, in the following. And um, so maybe it's, I mean, it, it's, it's an interesting, do we have light there? Yeah. Some some supergroup, some Katsumuri algebra based on a supergroup, which is an extension of the um, <coughs> uh, of the super Poincaré group, and but and the whole the whole superstring is somehow based on this Katsumuri algebra. Calculate um, the OPE between B and itself um, to observe and then get this ugly, this ugly thing here. And uh, the logic is B is a first class constraint, so it's constrained to be zero. So we have some something that is zero times something that is zero, so the right hand side should also be zero for consistency. Now, if we look here at the first order pole, they are all linear in the constraints A and, and B, so this is already zero by itself. But there are these two terms which are not yet zero, um, so we need to impose them to be zero as well. Um, so define C is this bilinear in B, which appears up here, and get some anti-symmetrization in the indices from this gamma matrices and uh, and D this guy here with one derivative acting on on the second D it, it is not just the derivative of C so D is not the derivative of C the 
it's because of the, the centralization. But uh, yeah, so we have two new independent constraints, and if we plug them back, then we have a first. And no, normally so far. But that's all classical. Classical, so you don't accept. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So we're, that's what I write here. It means I drop okay. all alpha prime square in terms. Mm. Yeah, and so the rest of the algebra, just to, to show it to you once. Um, first, A, B, C, A, B, C, and D, um, all these constraint operators. If I take the OPE with A, that's just the, the OPE that A is the energy momentum tensor, so that would be the check of primarity, and classically, of course, they are primary. Uh, and then the rest of the the rest of the OPEs are here. They are really uh, not very or NG. enlightening or beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> uh, by Mathematica. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's but actually, but Siegel didn't use the computer, and he did. <laughs> he did the same. Um, well, he derived this classical algebra uh, using Poisson brackets. So he was really using equal time Poisson brackets, and I've derived the same now with the OPEs. But it's using that method. Yeah. Mm. Um, you use a package. Sounds like more tricky to set up mathematical tools as well as doing Python. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> but, so I was using an, there's a package for OPE calculations by Tiedemanns, which is already quite quite old, the package. Um, and I was I was adding a lot of own coding to, to make it better suitable for tensor calculations and also implementing some fields identities and stuff. And hopefully, hopefully, uh, but I intend to make my own package out of that. Uh, so if anybody of you has some packaging experience, I would be happy to discuss about this. Okay. Um, so what you need to remember about this algebra is not too much, but uh, maybe so first we have maximally third order poles down here, otherwise it's only first and second order poles. And then uh, the, the structure constants in front of the gauge constraints, they are not constants, they are almost everywhere uh, structure functions. Um, yeah, this yeah. algebra linear in constraints? Modulo the point you just made. Uh, or are there that's quadratic nonlinearities? Uh, that's a good question. So this classical CD algebra is linear in the constraints. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not 100% sure about the full quantum mm -hmm. algebra that I will show in the end. But um, yeah, it's linear in the constraints. Yeah. OK, and it's, it's quite ugly. But don't blame me for that. Do the <laughs> Actually, I've never met him. I'm not sure if the photos are today. So. No, they look the same. <laughs> okay, and, and he was also he also introduced this this Siegel string. Actually, that was the calculating the algebra was um, needed to to create this uh, Siegel string. Only the idea of the Siegel string is that you start with the pre-action that we showed in the beginning, that I showed in the beginning, and, and you gauge the symmetries of the green schwarz string. So you gauge local diffeomorphism invariance and you gauge upper symmetry. And then, because of this algebra, you need to gauge also C and D. And then you get a... a yeah, this mu, psi, chi, and phi, they are gauge fields. Um, or Lagrange multipliers, if you want, because they set the constraints to zero, if you vary with respect to them. But if you, if you want to calculate their transformation under these uh, gauge symmetries, it's, 
it's really quite painful because then this whole algebra that I just showed to you enters and it's, uh, it's getting quite horrible. But um, um, the upshot is that starting from this complete serial string, one can either gauge fix all these gauge fields to zero and arrives at the free string that we started with. Or, and well, I'm by now quite convinced of that, but I still haven't um, found anybody confirming this, so maybe, maybe you can tell me that I'm wrong or not. I think that it's also possible to use these gauge symmetries or part of, <coughs> of those additional gauge symmetries to fix, to gauge fix D to zero and arrive back at the green Schwartz action. Because if you, if it's possible to gauge fix D equals zero, then uh, B and C and D are all linear in D. So all these terms disappear. This term disappears and we have the green Schwartz action well in conformal gauge. And this one is just uh, the gauging of the geomorphism occurrence. So these two together are the original green Schwartz stream. Uh, so I'm quite convinced that this is possible, but um, yeah, maybe I'm wrong. At least in the literature, I haven't found any statement like this. But there are statements like um, comparing uh, uh, vertex operators and so on. So, but in, in the test case, in Hamiltonian formalism, there's a litmus test for admissibility of a gauge condition, right? Based on doing a Poisson bracket computation, and, and there's a concrete, uh, schematic way of deciding whether a, a, a candidate gauge condition is good or not. Now, can, can you consider applying the test? Uh, Basically, you commute it with Poisson, commute it with the with the constraint or something like that. I, I can't remember now. Uh, if it sounds, yeah, probably you need to, okay. Uh, well, I, I think that's more about, so what, what you want to have is that your gauge constraint together with your gauge fixing condition in the end form a second class algebra. Then you have completely, then you're sure that you have completely fixed the gauge. But that's not really what I want here because I don't, I don't want to fix completely the gauge. I just want to get to green Schwartz. Uh, so for me, it's really only the question whether d equals zero is, uh, is possible. And I, well, the, the funny thing is that, that using kappa symmetry, it seems to be possible. But actually, I don't want to fix kappa symmetry because kappa symmetry should be present also in the green Schwartz string. So it's, um, yeah, I haven't understood There's it. No it clean test. Like, okay. There's not a simple clean test. Well, maybe there is, but if you, so, if you can tell me one, um, I, I would be happy to know. Um, well, I guess I should speak up. Um, okay, so let's come to to some first uh, results. The anomalies. Okay, this one is not a new result. The central charge of the energy momentum tensor is well known. N is 22. Then D, this Siegel operator D, fails, fails to be quantum primary. Um, the reason is it has, well, one, one gets a fourth and a third order pole, and one can cancel one of these poles by choosing here an extra quantum correction. Uh, but one cannot cancel both of the poles. And um, then further anomalies are, it's now again just a list that you don't need to memorize just to show you what kind of anomalies we will get. There's a BB anomaly down here, which has a 16 pi gamma, <laughs> anyway, not important. And then these are the remaining anomalies. And again, what is interesting is that most of these anomalies are not C numbers. They are um, contain a lot of, of fields only here. 
there's some C not right here and the highest order forms, but plenty of other stuff. So that's the the task, that's what we want to cancel. So how did they come about? So I just did the anomaly. It was classical computation, you said. So no, now I just did the same calculation, but I didn't neglect the alpha prime corrections any longer. To what level? Like two contractions now in your lab or all contractions? All, all contractions. All contractions. Yeah. I see. But that OP operator, sorry, operator product expansion. But you can see it um, just like being equivalent to calculating commutators. And then if you replace uh, these poles set minus W to the power 3 in a commutator, you would have a, a delta function uh, of set a derivative, second derivative of a delta function. Or here, third derivative. And the first order pole is like a delta function. So now, finally, let's uh, let's move on to the to the pure spinner formalism, and I will stick just to the minimal one. So for minimal one, and there we we start with the same free action as before, but we add some ghost fields. So we mainly have two more ingredients, namely ghost fields lambda alpha with the pure spinner, with the so-called pure spinner constraint, which is this quadratic constraint where the lambdas are uh, where a gamma matrix is sandwiched between the lambdas. And uh, and the BRST current, which usually the BRST current is always built uh, ghosts times the gauge constraints. But here it is ghost times D. And D was originally in the green Schwartz string. It was the, this mixed second first class constraint, which we actually didn't want to strictly impose now. But because of the fact that lambda is constrained, so it's not completely uh, free, it has less components. So originally it has 16 components, but this constraint removes uh, removes five of the components, so lambda has effectively only 11 components. And that means that um, you also don't set all the components of D to zero, but only um, 11. Uh, maybe if one can do linear arguments. In any case, it's not a standard BRST operator because of this quadratic constraint. And so this BST current that uses a BST differential and the one I call S. And um, a particularity about this, so that's all you, know, you need to know about the pure spinner formalism. Um, and a priori, uh, the pure spinner string doesn't have local diffeomorphism and variance built in. So there is not, there are no diffeomorphism B ghosts whose BST transformations are the energy momentum tensor. And uh, that was a, so Berkowitz and other people in the community were struggling a long time to, to try to construct a, a composite E ghost. So the only ghosts we have are these lambdas and their conjugate momenta. And, uh, and people were struggling to construct a composite uh, B ghost which obeys this, but in this so-called minimal formalism it's not possible and the best one can do is to, uh, to create a chain of operators which, which obey these relations. So there is a, an object G alpha whose BRST transformation is lambda alpha times T. So it's not T, but it's uh, ghost times T. And then there is an object H whose transformation is lambda times G, and then there's a K whose BST transformation is lambda times H. That's symbol S in front of every network. Right? Uh, that's my notion of the oh, BST differential. differential. Uh, and then here, so we always have some, some anti symmetrization of the indices. And then here, this chain stops. So there is no. Basically, because if I take another lambda and uh, put it 
it in front of the L and anti-symmetrize everything in front of it, then it's just zero. So I don't need like our operators. And the interesting thing in this context is that the first operators, um, T, G, and H, they contain the Siegel operators. So T, the energy momentum tensor, is just our original energy momentum tensor plus some ghost contributions. G alpha turns out to be the copper symmetry generator plus some ghost com contributions. H alpha beta turns out to be this, this C plus ghost contributions. And K and L um, are, they don't appear at classical level be, um, because they are zero for one sense, the ghosts to zero. Mm. Yeah, and so later, Berkowitz introduced also so called non minimal formalism, and there it's possible to construct a composite B ghost such that uh, the energy momentum tensor is exact. And this composite B ghost then contains all of these operators G, H, K, and L. So it contains our Siegel operators. But note, note that none of these operators contains the Siegel operator D. So D is still missing, only A, B, C are there. And of course, he um, it's not that, that I discovered this. Uh, of course, he, he noted that already when he was introducing, I mean, when Berkowitz was introducing his operators, G, H, and so on, he was giving a footnote that it's interesting that the CD operators appear there, but that was all, all about it. Um, so the natural question is, are G and H the correct quantum extensions of, of B and C? So do they do they give an anomaly free algebra and, and where is D? So the first answer is um, with this naive extension the anomalies are not cancelled. Um, and I will show you but I will show you where, where D is because the classical algebra is still still interesting to some extent. Namely if one just looks at the algebra that is generated by acting with G alpha. So remember, G alpha contains the couple symmetry generator B alpha. Um, so if I act with G alpha on T, then because it's primary, I just get G alpha. Um, and if I act with, again with G alpha, but now on the second order pole result, so on, on G beta, then I get H. Now I take this H and I act again with G alpha on it, then I get K, and then I act with G on K and I get L, and then I act with G on L and I get nothing. So I really generate the, uh, this Berkowitz chain by just calculating the, the OPEs. Um, but I generate also another chain of operators down here at the first order pole. And this one here, happens to contain the CBD. And then I get even more conformal weight three operators, which uh, which all vanish again if I send the ghost to zero. But I get a whole new chain of, of operators that have not been has not been known before. Does the chain stop? That's a good question. Unfortunately I don't know. Um, because down here the calculations are getting really nasty. Yeah, so in the last line that you cannot see, I have given the explicit expression of this dh just because it's one of the new results, but uh, it's not so enlightening. Enlightening. It contains the CVD and some other stuff. What's the common difference between G and D? The the relation between uh, the common difference between G and ah, between D. between G and D. Um, uh, I've also, yeah, I've also calculated that and I think it contains a, a third order pole uh, with K or something like K, some particular symmetrization of K and a second order pole. So basically the things repeat 
I adjust the bolt switch a little bit and the symmetrizations of the object. Um, yeah, but I haven't. So this this algebra, although it has some interesting structure, it's not the end of the story. So I was not exploring every every corner of it. You only looked at the V two operators, algebra of V two. And now that's what he was asking now, so no, I... But there are many more, you could have G with, uh, I don't know, yeah. H with A, sorry. No, I was also, I was calculating, for example, D with D. Uh, so I was doing more calculations, but but uh, mainly to see if if the anomalies cancel, and they, they didn't cancel for all this, and then I I didn't push this too, too far. So... But I even the the, the man with two. What about H with H, K with K, and so on? Yeah, they um, they one can make some relation using a, a version of of the Jacobi identity for the OPEs that uh, tell me the poles, how the poles of H with H are related to those of uh, G with K. So already from the fact that they have the same number of indices. Um, it's it's probable that there are relations and in fact there are relations, but it's you're right. So I mean, are you saying true. that uh, since Jacobi identities are old, it suffices to know the ones you listed here? Are you I, no, I'm not. I'm not claiming that. No. That, but um, so at least one needs to calculate also uh, these ones with these ones because they can even produce higher conformal weight things. So in fact, um, there's a picture like this. Um, one can go further and further in conformal weight, and uh, and then higher and higher in the, in the spin. And unfortunately, I don't. The only thing where I know for sure that it stops is here in the first line. And the other lines are really getting. I mean, the the biggest problem is to to shuffle together the terms to something that one already knows and to make sure that there's not something new um, and for for these more sophisticated calculations um, it's it's really a disaster to answer these questions maybe I can for the second row I still call him I still hope that I can find an answer is there a hard spin algebra as a sub algebra on this course? Uh, higher spin? Algebra. Generator. Higher spin. In what sense higher spin? What higher spin? In what uh, dimension? Roll sheet higher uh, spin? You mean, sheet higher spin. You mean higher dimensional operators? Yes. Well, clearly it uh, so keeps going up, right? So the spin yeah. is, uh, the conformal weight is, is he, here is 4. But I have for sure all these H equal 3 operators up till here, I have explicitly calculated. And then here, I mean, I can, I can do the calculation in Mathematica and I get some huge result, but then I don't know how much of it cancels and disappears. Or, so I have not a definite answer if these objects are really there or maybe uh, they are not there. <laughs> so I don't know if there's too much high speed. Um, yeah, probably I should come to an end before I lose the rest of my audience. <laughs> we have a meeting, so. Okay. Um, so that's actually now the the main message is that we need to redefine our objects uh, because before this G alpha was not BRST invariant, but it obeyed some BRST chain. The BRT transformation of G alpha was lambda alpha T. So it's quite obvious that one can make such a redefinition and get something, something BRT invariant. And if you are interested in a constraint algebra, gauge constraint algebra, it's somehow natural to look for BRT invariant, better BRT exact object. Um, so therefore, it's natural to start with this BRT invariant thing and then calculate the algebra that is generated by it. And because of the fact that one actually gets kind of an infinite thing, I was introducing some some more general notation, but don't worry about this. It's 
it's a similar picture than before. Uh, we go down and we go, we can go in this direction, get higher spin objects. Uh, the main difference to before is that now all these objects are by construction VRST invariant and also these are all VRST invariant. And also main difference is that here not even the first uh, column stops, uh, but one, one gets linear combinations of, of previous objects, but as we, as we need as we want them to be BRST invariant, uh, it's still a non-trivial fact that this combination is BRST invariant. So one cannot really say that all what comes below is um, is no new information. Uh, do you have a question? I would appreciate a question at this point. Will <laughs> the, will, will, will it end eventually? Ah, yeah, Just after 16, you're sorry, right, 16. you're right. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yes, okay, yes. good, you're right. But it does not stop here after, after 4. Um, in spite of, I mean, it stops in some sense that we don't get really new operators. They are all just uh, linear, combina linear combinations of the old ones. But um, uh, it's still not not so clear that this linear combination is BRST invariant again. So that's why it's kind of new information that we get. And uh, yeah, there are some technical difficulties in, in extracting. In the, in the OPEs, one has always the highest order pole as a primary. Uh, but then in the, in the lower order poles, one gets descendants of the higher order pole. That's here just a derivative, but if one goes higher and higher, one needs to subtract higher descendants. And uh, up to the second descendant, it's still known how to calculate it, and it looks already quite horrible. So that's the form of a second descendant. It has some component with the second derivative of the higher pole, and this one here is a normal order product with the energy momentum tensor. And they need to have these or the coefficients in front with the rates of the ten of the operators A and B. So I'm, I'm saying this just to, um, if one wants to go further and further in this algebra and to explore the higher spins and so on, then it's getting extremely hard to sub, to uh, extract the primary part uh, to get the new operator at a certain conformal rate. Um, that's why, why I'm kind of stuck in answering some of these questions, whether it's finite or somewhere. Uh, and down there would be the Jacobi identity that I was mentioning before. But it's I'm mentioning it mainly because the Jacobi identity is something very natural for commutators, but for OPEs, it's hard to find it in the literature. And in fact, I. I didn't find it in the beginning at all, so finally I derived it myself, and then after having derived it, um, I found it in Tiedemann's thesis. <laughs> uh, so keep it in mind if you, if you search for it, ask me, I'll show you. Um, yeah, and, and there are some interesting properties now of this algebra. Instead of having a, a BRST chain of operators, we have a supersymmetry chain of operators because our redefinition made the operators BRST invariant, but they broke um, supersymmetry. But now um, the variation of a the supersymmetry variation of this original, so G alpha is the, the BRST invariant redefinition. Mm. It is not it is not uh, supersymmetric invariant any longer, but its variation is something like this, and T is a constraint, so it's BRST exact. So at the cohomological level, it's still supersymmetric. So it's not a contradiction to, to supersymmetry. Okay, so uh, let me scroll through this. Uh, that's now, again, this, uh, this 
chain structure, G is always going, OPEs with G always push you, push you down, and supersymmetry transformations will be up. Um, skip all this. Is that already the conclusions? Ah, okay. Ah, okay. Sorry. Just this is somehow the, the main uh, the main message because these are the, the main goal was to cancel the anomalies and I haven't said anything about the cancellation of the anomalies. Now, uh, the operators A, B, C, and D, the, the original CV operators, they sit now in these uh, T, G alpha, G alpha beta, and G alpha beta with component rate 3. And uh, these are, the, the first observation is they are all quantum primary, while A and D were, were not quantum primary. And then, all these anomalies, the horrible ones that I showed you in the, in the beginning, um, these ones, all these, they disappear completely. So I have um, So I'm not saying that I calculated all the all possible anomalies of the whole infinite algebra. But I calculated all those that at the classical level um, were in trouble, or not at the classical level, at ghost-free level. And all these vanish and, and actually quite non-trivial. And originally I had prepared a small uh, Mathematica notebook uh, to show you how non-trivially pages of formulas uh, suddenly disappear and become zero. Uh, but because of lack of time, I I just tell you my excitement about it. <laughs> um, and then, so I was quite happy when discovering this, but then I calculated uh, the OPE between, so basically between D and itself, but its ghost extension, so between two of these. And I did, and I obtained the non vanishing, a non vanishing fourth. Or a pole uh, was already quite desperate because I thought the dream is, is over. But then it turned out that so there were some terms where it was obvious that they would not cancel and not uh, just be zero. But then they nicely combined to uh, to the energy momentum tensor times the metric. So in the end, it's just a quantum correction of the structured constants. So. Um, to summarize, um, so I've shown you the CV algebra and uh, the ghost extension to these Berkowitz B ghost chain things, uh, which were not anomaly free, and then I did this BST invariant redefinition, and there we didn't um, didn't discover any anomalies, at least between those operators that contain a classical uh, ghost free part, and. Somehow we believe that the whole algebra is free of anomalies. But of course, uh, it's kind of hard to answer if I don't have a very good argument. This is pretty true. And as I was saying, I plan to, to make a mathematical package about that. And yeah, the outlook is not so important now. Okay, that's it. All right, thank you. Yeah, so I suggest unless there is a very, very pressing question that we just talk to Sebastian because he's right here. And otherwise, uh, let's thank him again. Thank you.